All right, take out your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 1 John. And this morning, we're continuing in chapter 2. So 1 John chapter 2. And uh, always excited when we come to God's Word. This morning, we'll be picking up in verse 15 to the end of the chapter. 1 John chapter 2. And uh, let's pray. Oh, Lord, how we thank you uh, for the work you're doing in our fellowship. Just to see people saved yesterday, to to be involved in our community, to ordain another pastor. Lord, it, it it just blesses me, Lord, to see how you continue to do the work through your people. This is your church, Lord. And we ask now that this is your word. You would speak to it and through it to our lives and that we would heed your word because you want to protect us. And this is exhortation for all of us to take heed to this morning as we need to watch, uh, we need to watch and guard our lives lest we be deceived by the world or even by false teachers in these last days. So bless this time we have together. We pray in Jesus' name. We all say amen. So we've entitled, of course, this series, Get Real, as John exhorts us to really be real before God and to step up to the plate, as it were, and walk the talk. And uh, so we're into our third message here in the series in chapter two. And John's going to talk about the company that we keep. I think of Paul's words to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He said, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Or as the New Living Translation says, bad company corrupts good character. It's something, of course, that we as parents are always teaching our children that as they grow up, they make wise decisions of who they hang out with. And God's word is the same. He he is uh, warning us of who we would listen to or uh, where we would spend our time uh, because we want to grow closer in our walks with the Lord, but there are those that would like to take us from that. So I've entitled our message this morning, Bad Company. Uh, John is talking about two major concerns. We put them there in your outline. The deception of the world that's always bombarding us, and then the deception of false teachers. Now, he begins with the deception of the world. This is verses 15 through 17. John writes, verse 15, do not love the world. This is for us to Christians. He's saying, do not love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I've mentioned to you many times already, John is very black and white, right? When it comes to Christianity, he's very black and white. Listen, he's saying you cannot love the world. By the way, that word is agape, the highest form of love. And say that you love God. Jesus said it in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Because he'll either hate the one or love the other. Or he'll be loyal to the one and not to the other. He'll despise him. So John is giving us this warning of not loving the world. Now, when he talks about the world, what is he specifically talking about? Well, I think that we need to know what he's not talking about. He's certainly not talking about God's physical creation because the Bible tells us that God has created the mountains, the trees, the flowers, the the seas, and he's created it all uh, for us to enjoy. But not only that, he created it to testify of who he is, that we would see all of creation and go, there is a creator. There is a God. In fact, Psalm 19 and verse 1 tells us that. It tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. And so John's not talking about the physical creation. We should adore that. Not only that, he's not talking about lost humanity. Because we know, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. He's talking about fallen mankind. That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In fact, in Luke 19.10, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's those lost in the world. So he's not talking about lost humanity. We should love all of humanity. Now, what John is talking about, well, first of all, the word world uh, is the Greek word cosmos. We've heard that before. And it means an organized system. And of course, God, of course, created this beautiful world, this organized system. And when we talk about um, this term world, it usually, it it talks about those associated with it. For example, we talk about the world of sports, right? 
And when we talk about the world of sports, we talk about those who are associated with all the activities that go on with sports or involved and so forth. Or if we talk about the world of politics, oh boy, you know, we talk about all those involved in politics. So when John talks about the world here, he's talking about those within this system, but the system that is not run by God, created by God, but run by Satan. In 1 John 5, 19, it tells us the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one or Satan. In fact, Jesus called Satan in John 12, 31, the prince of this world. And because of that, Jesus warned his disciples. And we're warned as well in John 15, 19. He said, first of all, if you were of the world as believers, the world would love you in its own. But you're not of the world because I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. And so he's exhorting us not to be worldly because we're no longer part of this fallen system. In fact, Philippians 3.20 tells us, I'm now a citizen of heaven. Praise the Lord for that. But because of that, Satan will hate us. The world will hate us. In fact, Jesus said in John 17, 6, you're in the world. I mean, we're here, but we're not of this world. We're not part of this fallen system. So to love the world, as John says in verse 15, is to be opposed then to God's kingdom and Christ's kingdom. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12 talks about the spirit of this world that is opposed to God. So to love the world would be antithetical to the things of God. If the values of this world are opposed to God, why would I embrace them? Why would I love them? So John gives us this very strong language in verse 15. If anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's very strong. You know, James was even stronger. In James 4.4, 4, this is what he writes. Adulterers, adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to even be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. <laughs> so loving the world is not a minor issue. Uh, uh, James is saying, if we love the world, we're, we're playing spiritual adultery. When the children of Israel forsook God, whenever they went after other idols, which they did on many occasions, God would use that term, you're committing adultery. You're forsaking the true love for these counterfeits. And so we don't even want to flirt with the world. We don't want to court the world. We don't want to be friends with the world. But we have examples of this. Paul gives one example of a man who fell into that trap. His name was Demas. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, he said, Demas, one of my friends, has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and departed. Now, it's interesting. We don't read of Demas that he went to a horrible life of crime or he committed murder or anything like that. No, he just departed. Slowly but surely, he dropped his commitment. Hey, Paul, I can't go with you anymore. I'm not gonna see you at church anymore. He stopped fellowshipping with his Christian friends. Probably stopped reading his Bible and fellowshipping, and he replaced what he used to do with worldly things. And one day, he just never came back. I don't know if it sounds familiar to you, but that happens amongst God's people and in the church all the time. A person comes to church, maybe they even get saved, and they're here for several years following Jesus, or at some other church, and they're there for a while, but then you call them, and, you know, because I, I do, if I, if I know some people I haven't seen, I'll call them, how are you doing? Is everything okay? And it's always some kind of excuse. Oh, we got, you know, with the kids, we got baseball practice and we're doing this and we got to do this over there. I know some people have the kids in sport. They're still here. But I, you know, I hear that all the time. And then you look on social media, these people who can't, I mean, I can't been around. And you see them there with their worldly friends on social media, going everywhere and doing all this stuff. So, you know, what happens is the lurement of the world, it becomes so strong, so strong. And so John says that we can't have fellowship with the world. Now, as I said, some of these people are even saved, and what happens is they backslide. Some aren't even saved to begin with. He talks about that actually in verse 19. But this happens even to believers. There's a classic example of this is Lot. So I'd like you to hold your finger here. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 13. We're familiar with it, but I just want us to see it in print. It's so good. 
Now, first of all, let me say this. So, like I said, believers can fall in this trap. Lot was a believer. Now, if you read the book, the account in Genesis, you're thinking, there's no way the guy's a believer. We only know he's a believer because 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7 tells us he was. Otherwise, if you look at his life, you would think there's no way. Now, in Genesis 13, well, first of all, let me say this. In chapter 12, this is where we have God calling Abraham, get out of your country and go to the land, I'll tell you. And what happens is in verse 5 of chapter 12, he, he brings his nephew Lot with him. So now you come to chapter 13. We'll pick up in verse 17. But there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And of course, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. And Abram now says to Lot, please, let there be no strife between you and me, between my men and your men. We're brethren. Look, verse 9. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, I'll take the right. If you go right, I'll take the left. So Lot lifted his eyes. He saw the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar, you know, by the, the delta there in, in Egypt. It's beautiful, the lush growing because of the water. Lot chose for himself then the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east and they separated from each other. Now, the first thing I just want you to see here is that Lot was driven by his sight, what he saw. He wasn't driven by faith. He said, oh, well, that looks good. So it tells us that he pitched his tent in the plain of Sodom. Now, move ahead to chapter 14 of Genesis and look at verse 12. Now, we read here that the kings of the area had attacked Sodom and Gomorrah, but notice it says, and also took Lot, Abraham's brother, who dwelt in Sodom. I just want you to know, at one time he dwelt his tent outside of Sodom. Now he was living in Sodom. Now in verse 16 of chapter 14, Abraham rescues Lot. No doubt encouraged him. You shouldn't be living here, brother. You, you need to move out of here. Because it had become so evil. In fact, God was going to send some angels to destroy it. So let's go to chapter 19. Let's move ahead. Now, two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and what I want you to see here is Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. That's very significant. We know this. I teach this all the time. The gate of the city is where the elders meet. This would be the uh, place where the leaders of the city, the chief, and even where the court of law is held at the gate of the city. That tells us that Lot now is one of the chief officials of the city. He's moved up. Lot saw him. He arose to meet them. He bowed his face to the ground. They didn't look like angels, just looked like ordinary men. He says, here, my lords, please turn into your servant's house. Spend the night. Wash your feet. You may rise early and then go your way. They said, no, we'll spend the night in the open square. He insisted strongly. Lot knew it wasn't a good idea. So they turned in with him into the house, and he made them a feast, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. And before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, old and young, all the people of every quarter surrounded the house. They called out Lot and said, hey, where are the men that came with you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them carnally. I'd like to have sex with those guys that came over. That's what they're saying. Forcibly, if you don't give them to us. Lot went out the doorway, shut the door behind, said, please, brother, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do this. But look what he does in verse 8. See now, I've uh, I got two daughters. They've not known a man. They're virgins. Please let them bring it out to you and that you may do with them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since this is the reason why they've come under the shadow of my roof. So Lot, Lot doesn't want these men to rape these angels that they don't know are angels, but he has no problem giving them his virgin daughters. This, this is how corrupt Lot has become by now. He's just gone with the world. It's, it's, uh, that can happen. So he's a believer that was believers, you know, I, 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 it doesn't matter. I can do this. I can go there. It's fine. They said, stand back. This one who came to stay here keeps acting like a judge. Now we'll deal worse with you than them. So they pressed hard, all these men, against the man Lot. Came near to break down the door. But the men, that's the angels, reached out their hands, pulled Lot into the house with them, shut the door, struck the men who were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. So that tells us even though they were blinded, they were still trying to get to him. Verse 15, and when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, hurry, arise, get your wife, get your daughters who are here. Unless you be consumed, this city is going to be punished. 
And in verse 16, it says, while he lingered. What that tells us is Paul, I mean, Lot isn't really sure he wants to go. Oh, he's lingering. I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I really, are you kidding me? What, what's it going to take, man? But you see, first he pitched his tent in Sodom. Then he lived in Sodom, and here's the problem. Sodom's now living in him. Now, by the grace of God, it tells us here that the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, the hands of his daughters. The Lord, being merciful to him, brought him out and set him outside of the city. But I want you to know, that compromise, that constant compromise, cost him everything. Cost him his wife, she died. Cost him his two daughters who got involved in incest. A horrible, horrible mess. All because of compromise. He loved the world. Now you go back to 1 John 2.15. This is why John warns us about loving the world. How about Romans 12 and verse 2? It says, do not be conformed to this world. I like that because the word conformed there in the original language means to be pressed into a mold. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Isn't that exactly what the world's trying to do? <laughs> this is what you should do. This is what you should. They're trying to control us, right? Of course they are. That's the world. Just as gravity holds our physical bodies to this earth, so the world is pulling at our hearts all the time. So John says it's dangerous, and it happens in three predominant ways, verse 16. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. By the way, all three of these are seen in the original sin in the garden. Satan, you remember, lied to Eve, Genesis 3, 4. Oh, God says you can't eat. You're not going to die. For God knows the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open. You're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, this was the lust of the flesh. Oh, I think that'll, that'll please me. I'll like that, lust of the flesh. And it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. If you eat it, you'll be like God, pride of life. So she took the fruit and she ate. So all three were there in the garden. So let's talk about these. The lust of the flesh. The word lust, by the way, let me say this. Lust, uh, we, we know it in our context of our English language, but this is really a neutral word. The Greek word is epithumia. It could, it could be translated lust or simply desire. It, it really means a desire. So I need to understand, we need to understand, God has given us desires, and they are good desires. Hunger is a natural desire, right? Thirst is a natural desire. Even sexual intimacy is a natural desire that God gives us. So you think about this. Hunger is not evil, but gluttony, that's a sin when you overdo it, right? Thirst is not evil. Drunkenness is a sin. Sexual intimacy within a marriage relationship is a blessing. Outside it is a sin. So we all possess God-given desires, but when it goes to the fallen nature, to the flesh, oh my goodness, what it does. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, that our flesh is weak. And we're constantly warned in the Bible. That's why it's good to read your Bible regularly, because we need to hear that again and again and again. In Romans 7, 18, Paul says, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. He didn't say a few things. No, this is it's pretty bad. Philippians 3, 3 says, put no confidence in the flesh. Romans 13, 14, make no provision for the flesh. So we could definitely say the flesh, bad company. Bad company, right? But we gotta live with it. We're in the flesh. I mean, we're in this body, so we have to be on our guard. The next thing he talks about is the lust of the eyes. Oh, we know all about that. We're bombarded with it all the time. Now, with our eyes, we can see the beauty of God's creation. Man, it's really awesome, right? But then sometimes we look at somebody else. Oh, I like that God's creation, you know? And we're putting our eyes in a way that is improper. Whether it's a man looking at a woman and a woman and a man in an improper way, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, if you're looking at them in such a way that you lust for them, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And, but this is exactly what advertisers appeal to. We all see it. We, you know, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. You see this good-looking person. It could be guys and girls. They use both, you know. And, and you're going, where is this commercial going? And it has nothing to do with the product at all. Have you ever noticed that? I, I noticed, here's one I just saw yesterday. 
is this really good looking guy, you know, and he's like, you know, he's got a shirt. He's like, you know, looking at that look, you know, whatever. And, and I knew, oh, I, I know Christmas is coming. I bet it's going to be a perfume commercial. It's a perfume. I'm like, what does this have to do with this good looking guy? But, you know, some women are going, man, I got to get that for my husband. If he's going to look like that, I, I got to get that stuff, you know. But we, we know it. It's always, it uses sex because it works. People succumb to the f- flesh, what they see with their eyes. And, but it's not just people. It could be things. I think of Joshua chapter 7 and verse 21. It talks about Achan. God said, don't take any of these things when we conquer the city. But he did. And he confesses and he says this, when I saw the spoils, when I saw the beautiful Babylonian uh, garment, when I saw the silver, I coveted them. So, he, so sometimes it's people, sometimes it's possessions, but our eyes are, can get us off. So the lust of the eyes. And then he talks about the pride of life. And of course, that epitomizes the whole worldly system. And that makes sense because this was really uh, Satan's underlying sin. This is why he was cast out of heaven. And you could really say uh, most sin goes right back to pride. But I think of the fall of Satan. We have it in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Satan said this. I mean, here is this created being that God allows to be in his presence. And he says this, I'm now going to ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above all the other angels. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He had an eye problem five times, right? The epitome of pride. And that's what keeps people ultimately out of heaven. Their pride. Uh, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. Why do I need God, you know? I'm going to run my own life. I know what I'm doing. It's pride. It's pride that doesn't want to admit that we're sinners. It's pride that I need to humble myself. This is why the Bible talks so much about humility, right? God opposes the proud. He gives his grace to the humble. That's why Jesus said, you want to be saved, born again? You got to become like a child, unassuming, teachable, trusting. So verse 16, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father. It's of this world. This, these three things typify the world. And notice what he says about the world in verse 17. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. It's not going to be here forever. This whole system run by Satan, it's going to be done away with. First of all, it's going to be done away with when Jesus Christ comes in his second coming. It says he's going to establish his throne in Jerusalem, by the way. And it'll be his millennial reign for a thousand years. It'll be a perfect reign under Christ. The lust of this world. None of these things will exist at that time. But ultimately, beyond that, there's coming a time, the Bible tells us, that the Lord is going to create a new heavens and a whole new earth. It's going to be a complete do-over, you know. So all this is going to pass away. Why would you put your stock in this that doesn't even last? In fact, he says in the end of verse 17, he who does the will of God, he will abide forever. I don't know about you, but... I want to do the will of God. Where do I find the will of God? Right here. Right here. This is how I learn about God and how I can know his will so that I could be right with God and I could live forever. And not just know it, I want to do it, as James talks about, right? Being a doer of the word. Warren Wiersbe writes this, long after this world system with its vaunted culture, its proud philosophies, its egocentric intellectualism, and its godless materialism has been forgotten, and long after this planet has been replaced by the new heavens and the new earth, God's faithful servants, those who do the will of God, will remain sharing the glory of God for all eternity. So why would I put my stock in this world? I want to be part of his kingdom. So I always love the Lord's prayer. His kingdom come, his will be done. Well, his, for his kingdom to come, my kingdom's got to go gotta go but this is the deception of the world the world lies under the sway of satan it's lying to us it's seeking to draw us away from god and so we need god's word we need fellowship all the more i think the exhortation in hebrews really stands out so much as we see the day approaching of jesus hebrews 10 24 let us consider one another 
and stir up love and good works. That's why we come together, to stir up the love and the good works that we need, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another. Hey, we need to be in fellowship. Hey, let's keep on with the Lord. And so much more as we see the day approaching. So John talks about the deception of the world, bad company. Then secondly, he talks about the deception of false teachers, verses 18 through 29. That's bad company as well. He says, little children, that's a general term for believers, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Now, this last hour refers to the period of time between Christ's first and second coming. So God's, you need to understand, God's prophetical time clock began, went into full swing when Jesus came to earth. God went, click, here we go. It's on, it's on. And so Jesus lives his life, he dies on the cross, he rises from the dead, he ascends into heaven, and man, we are living, from that moment on, we are living in the last hour. Jesus could come at any time. John and all the disciples and all of the believers lived in the expectancy that Jesus could come at any time. And if John lived with that expectancy, and the disciples, how much more are we? You say, well, man, it's been 2,000 years. Yeah, well, Peter tells us that 1,000 years is like one day to the Lord and one day like 1,000. So to the Lord, it's been a couple days. It's nothing. Time is not, it's nothing for God. It's been like, boom. Listen, it's getting closer. I like the man who, it was an elderly man. He, was, he had an old grandfather clock. And one day it went haywire. And it was the evening, it was at midnight, and he was up, and it chimed 14 times. Two extra. Ding. He immediately jumped up and said to his wife, honey, it's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> well, we could say that. Listen, it's later than it's ever been before. We're living in the last hour. Jesus could come for the church at any time. This is why we remind ourselves, Maranoth, Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, he's coming. John adds, not only is Jesus coming, look at verse 18, as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Anti means opposed to or instead of. And this is exactly what the Antichrist will do. The Antichrist opposes Jesus and many will embrace him instead of Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of him in John 5, 43, saying, if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. And people will. We read about the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. We read about the Antichrist in the book of Revelation, empowered by Satan. He will be an incredible communicator. He will be a peacemaker. When he comes on the scene, on the world stage, people will embrace him. He will bring peace to the Middle East. He'll bring peace to most of the world. And everybody will go, this is fantastic. Let's make him the president of the world, or whatever his title will be. And everybody will be for it. I believe the Antichrist is living right now. No doubt in my mind. And so the first three and a half years when he's elected, it'll be peace finally. Not only that, the believers won't be here. We'll be raptured and everybody will be so happy. Fantastic, those Christians are gone. And then three and a half years of peace. Oh man, this is the greatest thing. But right in the middle will be the abomination of desolation. When he proclaims himself to be God, you will have to worship me if you don't. If you don't take my mark of the beast, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't do nothing. And, and I'll tell you, it's not going to be a good scenario. It's going to be horrible. We, and listen, we've studied that in depth. We've gone through the book of Revelation, through the Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 is a great chapter to look at. But if you're not familiar with the end time scenario, the best thing to do is get on, get on the app, Listen to the book of Revelation. Actually, the very first study is an overview of the whole book in one study to at least get it chronologically to help you. And then just go through it so you understand because the stage is set. But here's the thing. Until the Antichrist comes, there are many previews. All of these false teachers who go out into the world to deceive many, they are small a little Antichrist. James Walker, the president of Watchman Research, and we have him here. We've had him here for 20 plus years. He'll be here again at the end of this year. He maintains on file over 10,000 groups. Can you imagine that? 10,000 who are opposed and are uh, to biblical teaching, but are deceptive ministries. 
They include large groups, of course, like Jehovah Witness, Mormons, Scientologists, and so forth, but many others that aren't mainstream. Sometimes we only know the smaller groups because of the tragic things they do, right, over the years, like Jim Jones, David Koresh, Marshall Applewhite, you know, of Heaven's Gate. You know, they had the, the star that went by the comet and they killed themselves because they were gonna meet Jesus in the comet. All these horrible things. So more and more false religions, more false doctrines keep coming up so that you have now ministries that are full-time just to keep watch of them. Can you imagine that? Think of that. That's crazy. So many antichrists have gone in the world. We need to be on our guard. Jesus, Matthew chapter seven, verse 15, beware be in your guard against false prophets because they come to you in sheep's clothing. They appear to be so good. They seem genuine. So much of what they say is good. It's the 10% you need to worry about, right? Which is very serious. I always like to say a broken clock is right twice a day, right? And John mentions some of their characteristics. First, they depart from the true Christian church. Look at, they went out from us. He's talking about these antichrists, these false teachers. They went out from us. Because they were not of us, obviously. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be manifest that none of them were of us. I mean, obviously, one of the evidences of being a born-again Christian is that you remain in fellowship with God's people. 1 John 3, 14 says, We know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. And counterfeits inevitably depart. By the way, let me say this. That's not to say just because you go to church, you're saved. Of course, not at all. But habitual fellowship is definitely a proof that God is working in this person's life. But desertion, leaving the church, of course, is always a sign. This person's walking away from God. Judas, a perfect example of that, departed the 12, departed from Jesus. And in relationship to false teachers, what John is saying, because this is the context, what he's saying is many times they begin in the church. And then they leave it, of course, because they're not born again, and they go off with some crazy doctrine. You'll find that multiple commentators remark on this, as well as James, as, as I said, who has the ministry of watchmen. If they, one commentator writes this, if you investigate the history of false cults and anti-Christian religious systems in today's world, you will find that in most cases, their founders started out in a local church. That's true. David Koresh did. Jim Jones did. Herbert W. Armstrong of the Worldwide Church of God, he did. Taz Russell, Jehovah Witness, he did. Started in a regular church. Then went off. Paul warned the Ephesian church about this. Acts 20, 29. Know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, within the church, men will rise up speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples after themselves. So how do you stay clear of these people? How do you discern? Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Who's the anointing one? It's the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes you see that word anointing, you first of all think of all these crazy preachers on TV. We've got the anointing, you know. Well, you know, and they have some special deal, you know, like they've, they're the special lead. I want you to know every believer has the Holy Spirit. We're born of the Spirit. Every believer has this ability. So he says, you know all things. Now, when he talks about knowing all things, he's not saying you know everything about mathematics and science automatically. He's, he's talking about spiritual things. When he accept the Lord, God gives us the ability to discern, to know what is right, what is wrong. We have that ability. And, and how do we have that ability? First of all, because we have the Bible. John 17, 70 says, God's word is truth. And the Holy Spirit wrote this book. And then the Holy Spirit is within us. To, it, when we're reading the God's word, the Holy Spirit is revealing truth to us and he's warning us and leading us away from those things that are false. Notice he says, verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. You have God's word and that no lie is of the truth. You have the Holy Scriptures. And then you have John 16, 13 that tells us the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. So I'm reading it. 
And God is guiding in all truth. And here's the thing. When you read your Bible again and again and again, that's why I always encourage you, read your Bible all the time. Try to go through it once a year if you can. If you can't do it once a year, you know, however long, just start reading it and then just go again and again. And the more you read your Bible over and over and over, you're gonna be amazed what happens. All of a sudden you go, hey, that doesn't sound right. What that person said, that doesn't sound right. I'm looking at my, because you've read God's word and the Holy Spirit is bringing that to remembrance. And now you're looking, yeah, that, that's wrong, you see. All of a sudden you have this discernment that happens over time. John also points out another characteristic of false teachers, verse 22. Who is a liar, but he who denies Jesus is the Christ. That's the Messiah. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So here's the point. All false teachers inevitably deny the deity of Jesus Christ. I was talking to one of our brothers here in our church uh, yesterday afternoon. He said, before I came to the harvest thing, I was talking to some JWs. We were Jehovah Witnesses. I, I, don't, I like to call them JWs. I don't like to call them Jehovah Witnesses because they're not Jehovah's and they're not his witnesses. I just telling you that. But uh, they were talking to him and he, and he goes, we were just talking over it. It all breaks down at the deity of Jesus Christ. He's the son of God. He's a, he was created by God. He's a little less than God because that's where they all break down there. Mormonism, same thing. Always well, an angel, you know. Jesus said in John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. We're one and the same. John 10, 30, I and the Father am one. And so verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. We're one and the same. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Jesus said in Luke 9, 48, if you receive me, you receive the one who sent me. The point is this, Jesus Christ is God. And every cult, no matter what their deception is and their writings and stuff, they inevitably, all of them, reject the deity of Jesus Christ. I mean, even, you know, Islam, oh, Jesus, he was a good person. Jesus is a prophet. Well, he's not God, you see. Verse 24, therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. What is he talking about? The gospel truth. That truth abide in you that you heard when you were born again and you heard the truth of God's word. Let it sink in your heart. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will also abide in the Son and the Father. If you're born again, born of the Spirit of God, you receive the gospel of Christ, remain in that truth, abide in that truth, and you will abide with the Father. You will abide with the Son. You will grow. You'll be discerning. You want to keep bad company with those people. Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. The Father will love him. And we, plural, that's Jesus and the Father, will come and make our home with him. Pretty awesome. So I have the Father and the Son dwelling with me. Oh, and I have the Holy Spirit dwelling with me. Mind-blowing. That's the Trinity. And this is the promise that he has promised us, verse 25, eternal life. Isn't that great? I love how he puts that there. If you're truly born again, then you're in fellowship, you're staying away from false teachers, and you're born again, and God is gonna complete what he began. Right? Philippians 1, 6. Being calm for the very thing, he who began the good work will complete it until the day of Christ. John begins to summarize in verse 26. He says, these things I've written to you concerning those who tried to deceive you. I'm telling you these things because there are deceptions. There's the deceptions of the world falling into worldliness and there's a deception of these false teachers, these small antichrists. But we've been given God's word and the Holy Spirit so we can have discernment. We can be led into truth and stay in truth. Verse 27, but the anointing which you have received is from him abides in you. We have the Holy Spirit with you and you do not need that anyone teach you. In other words, you're not gonna be taught, have to be taught by anybody else or any other book. You have God's word and you have the Holy Spirit. That's enough. Now, let me say this. He's not saying when he says, well, I've heard people say, well, I don't need to go to church because it says right there, you don't need anybody to teach you. I just stay home, read my Bible. Well, saying, well, pastors are not needed. Well, Ephesians 4.11 says this. God gave pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So you need to understand God is not discounting the office of pastor teacher that he put in place for the church. We should be under good biblical teaching. You need that. We all need that. But what John is saying is, listen, we have the Holy Spirit and we have God's word. We don't need any other information from any other place. God has given us everything we have to keep us on track so that we're not deceived. Verse 27, he continues, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, the Holy Spirit is teaching us all truth 
because it is true and it's not a lie. And just as it is taught to you, you will abide with him. So if you're adhering to God's word, you know, you have the Lord continually teaching you through his word, and hopefully you're in a church that's teaching you the word as well, then you're gonna continue to abide with him. You don't have to worry about falling in deception. That word to abide means to stay in contact with, means to remain in fellowship with. And so genuine believers, as opposed to those who are deceivers, always are abiding in God's word, always seeking to walk in the Holy Spirit, always in fellowship with God's people. John adds in verse 28, and now little children, abide in him. In other words, saying remain in him, be faithful to him. Why? That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So back in verse 18, he talked about the coming of the Antichrist. Now here he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. And when he's exhorting us is be faithful, continue to abide in his word, stay in fellowship. Why? Lest you be ashamed. Lest you be ashamed when Jesus comes and you're not ready. That's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? I, I, that's a frightful thing to me. I, I don't want to be, you know, be doing something stupid when Jesus comes. In Matthew 24, 44, Jesus said, be ready. Jesus himself, he's the one who's coming, and he himself says, better be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you don't expect. So the question is this, are you ready? I mean, are you looking forward to the return of Jesus? Now, maybe you secretly wish he doesn't come. I really don't want him to come. And, and then that ought to give you an indication maybe where you're at, right? It's in, it, because if you're not looking for his return, then maybe why? Why, you know? So John adds in verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, and of course he is, he, if you know he's the Lord, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. If you're truly born again, he's saying, start living it. Start living as though Jesus could come at any time. That's his point. And he, and he gives us these two warnings here. Very black and white, right? There's, there's deceptions. There's the deception of the world. This world is so deceptive, so alluring. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, probably like, my goodness, we're, we're tempted all the time. Now, let, let me remind you what I remind my kids all the time because we talk about when we're doing devotion and stuff. Listen, temptation is not a sin. Temptation is not a sin. We're all gonna be tempted. It's what you do with the temptation. You, you, you're tempted, that's not a sin. You haven't done anything. That temptation comes to you, reject it. And walk away from it. Go to God's word, pray, you know. Now, we, do we fall? Yes, we all do. But the temptation is not the sin. So know this, we're gonna be tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. Know that we are, so be on your guard. Don't keep bad company with the world, man. And then we have the deception of the false teachers. They deny Christ. They're, they're seeking to allure us away from the Lord. Oh, you don't have to, go. Maybe, maybe it's just, maybe it's, a, maybe it's the seeker movement. You don't have to go to church all the time. Just, you know, once a, once a month, that's good enough. Or you can watch online and don't have to go to church anymore ever again. You know, there are some people that are actually doing that. I don't, I, I don't even know if they'll ever be in fellowship again. I, I, that, that's not biblical. There might be a period of time where you need to do that, but you need to be in fellowship. So there's gonna be all kinds of deceptions. Let me close with these words of the poet who wrote this, because I wanna be ready for Jesus. They wrote this, Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power and love to reign. What if it were today? Faithful and true, would he find us here, watching in gladness and not in fear? What if he should come today? It's a great word, man, it's a great word. Are you ready? Now listen, you might not be ready <clears throat> because you're a Christian, but it's like, man, there's some things I need, to, I need to straighten up first. I need to get right. Well, good, this is the day to do it. Get right with God today. If you're a Christian and, and your life isn't where it should be, you don't need to leave here and go home and take it. You need to first right now make a recommitment to Jesus because if the commitment is there in your heart, if you put him first, seek first the kingdom of God is right, all the other things will fall into place. You gotta get right with Jesus first. But maybe you're hearing never even giving your life to Jesus. You could do that this morning. You could be right with the Lord. Because I tell you, you see all these things happening in the world? It, it's it's um, frightening, to be honest with you. It's scary. 
And uh, the devil wants to rip you off. You know, that's, you know, by the way, you know what the, you know, we're dealing, he's dealing with this conflict in the Middle East with Hamas. You know what the word Hamas means? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible a lot of time. In Hebrew, the word means violent, violence. It's the same word used, by the way, in Genesis chapter six, when God said there was Hamas in all the earth. And God said, I will destroy mankind. And he saved just Noah and his family. That's, that's how bad it was. Hamas is the work of the devil. It means violent. The Bible says the devil wants to steal, to kill, and destroy. So the same ripoff we see from Hamas, Hamas is lying to the Palestinian people. It's a movement of hatred and violence. It's not the Palestinians. They've been ripped off. And some of their own people are beginning to tell us, tell them, don't follow this. They're, they're taking advantage of this. That's the devil. He rips people off. But that's what this whole world does. That's what Satan does here. He's ripping people off here. When we go after the world, when we go after other things, he just wants to tear you down. So Jesus said, the devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but I've come to give you life and more abundantly. That life he offers you today by coming to him by faith. Saying, Jesus, here I am. Would you, would you take my life? Just as I am. He'll take you as you are. All you gotta do is say, I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross when I said you rose from the dead and I'm turning my life over to you. I'll tell you what, when you turn your life over to him, man, you flip in the switch, you, you get born again and it's a whole new life. You become a whole different person. God does that work. He does the work. You don't have to do God does that work. All you have to do is receive the free gift of grace and forgiveness. I hope you're willing to do that today. I, I, that's, that's the offer today. For those of you who are Christians, you need to come back to Jesus or to receive Jesus for the very first time. So will you bow with me in prayer?